fun. Welcome back. You're listening to Blunt Business on Cannabis Radio. I'm your host, Sean Eubanks, Vice President of Business Development, and we have Jay Kotzker for our The High Five segment. Welcome back, Jay. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So we cover a lot of things each week. Um, so much going on here. So first thing, Congress's agreement on another continuing resolution. That's right. Everyone's aware the government uh, went through a shutdown last week. Um, there was a little bit of debate about whether um, you know cannabis protection amendments were going to be in any new uh, funding bill or any continuing resolution. We got the answer to that pretty quickly. Um, the Rohrbacher Blumenauer amendment continues to stay with this continuing resolution, so that at least gives protections to um, medical marijuana businesses through February eighth. <laughs> Not a lot of time, but a little time. And so this is the seventh time this amendment's been extended. There was a little bit of a panic. I, n I noticed that social media, otherwise, uh, people were really starting to freak out. Uh, they were sort of looking at it as a separate issue of, oh my gosh, that amendment hasn't been extended. But of course, we had a shutdown, so a little bit of an overreaction there. Yeah, probably. Um, when you have these continuing resolutions, typically all of the writers and amendments that were part of the previous continuing resolution carry forward and that's what we saw this time. Unfortunately, we didn't get to add any sort of protections for adult use or recreational businesses. We had talked last time about the Polis Amendment, which would have expanded the coverage to not only medical marijuana businesses, but recreational as well. That did not make it into this continuing resolution. We can only hope that through the lobbying efforts of um, through the legislature that those types of protections are gonna be part of whatever this spending bill ultimately looks like. And so we're in a midterm year here. Do you think that they're going to rush to get this done? I know immigration was a big hot topic. Illegal immigration was. Uh, there's. I, I'm not sure how this shakes out. Who was who was blamed? Uh, outside of everyone just having a low approval of Congress in general, uh, do you anticipate them wrapping it up or just kind of kicking it down the road and, and, and doing it that way? Yeah, I don't. I don't see another continuing resolution past February eighth. I mean, I think that. Um, not only has Congress, but um, you know the, the, the community and, and the general public is tired of these continuing resolutions. They want to see something more formal, something more stable. And I think that's going to be a good opportunity for you know the Cannabis Caucus in Washington to really push for some stronger protections for cannabis businesses. Great. Hopefully that happens. So big news out of Vermont. Absolutely. Um, just this week, it became the ninth state in the country, um, in, along with Washington, D.C., to approve recreational use of cannabis. It's a little bit different. This is the first state to actually do it legislatively. Why that occurred is simply because there's no mechanism in the state for a, um, a citizen initiative, as we have seen in other states, to put it on the ballot. So it had to be done legislatively. And so now nationwide, 70 million people, more than one in five Americans, live in a legal marijuana state. Yeah, isn't that incredible? I mean, we're talking about a country of 350 million people or so, and 70 million of those people already live in a state where adult use is, is permitted. And so do you anticipate more states following Vermont on the legislative side, or do you think it's going to continue to be decided at the ballot box? You know, I, you know I'm not entirely sure. I think you're going to see a, a strong push for states to, to at least discuss it legislatively, and maybe that prompts um, you know, citizen initiatives and voter initiatives in states that have a mechanism that allows that. But I think it's promising that legislators in these states that are, are, you know, are tackling these issues and, and meeting them head on. And so in Vermont, you're allowed to possess one ounce of cannabis, two mature plants, four immature plants. Uh, it's funny, I think of that Cheez-It commercial with, the, you know, just not quite ready, right? They kind of go back, like, immature plant could be defined in a bunch of different ways. Sure. Um, in this industry, as long as it doesn't have a, a bud or a flower on it, it's immature. It's immature. Sounds good. So that's really good. Um, and then, uh, so do you anticipate, I, I would imagine Vermont's a state kind of like Colorado, where there's going to be a lot of people growing from home. Well, I think... What you're going to see is that that's really the only way. Um, what's interesting about Vermont is it it makes no mention of a of a commercial retail structure. It's still not allowing the the cultivation, you know, large scale cultivation and retail sale of cannabis. So what you're going to see is you're going to see people growing it at their house, yes. possessing you know possessing it legally, and that's really the only mechanism for adult use in the state right now. Um, the, the law doesn't affect any of the 5,000 current um, you know, medical card holders, so that program will remain as is. But it's just very interesting that they're going to allow adult use, 
but they're not going to create um, a, you know, a regulatory framework as you know, we see going on in Massachusetts and Colorado and California and other places like that. Um, which could have some, you know, some, some advantages, right? I mean, especially on the heels of the rescission of the coal memo, you're certainly not going to draw the attention in a state where you're not establishing a commercial program, even though you're allowing adult use. So this is fascinating. It seems to be the only true uh, ideological move a state can make because they're not, they're not dipping into, into tax uh, revenue. They're not benefiting in any way except for saying, we know you want it as a people and we're going to do that for you. Right. I mean, uh, the only thing that you could envision and seeing is that it's going to reduce arrests, reduce strain on the, you know, the, the law enforcement system. But with no commercial model, you know, the state's not going to reap any tax benefit from this at all. So is Governor Phil Scott an advocate or not? He says he's going to talk about it later in the year, but he's not. Uh, it just seems odd. It is. It's very strange. And, you know, we're going to look into it a little bit more. Um, Phil Scott certainly is, you know, I think he did this with a little bit of a mixed emotion. I think he even used those words in a press conference shortly after this uh, was passed. It's, I think, he, you know, he's, he's acquiescing to the, you know, the will of the people, but he's not coming out and saying, I'm going to create a, you know, a commercial cannabis market in the state. So uh, it'll be interesting to watch this one for sure. Uh, he, I know he's, he's, you know, asked for a couple studies to be done on, you know, education, public highway safety, things like that. And, you know, once all of the results of those tests and those, you know, um, those, you know, inquiries come back later in the year, I think he'll be open to maybe, you know, expanding this program. But he certainly uh, was very clear that, hey, I'm going to take care of it. We're going to take care of it legislatively right now. I'm going to sign it as the governor. I don't want to talk about it anymore for a while. <laughs> right. So do you think that this is a positive for Vermont? I mean, if I'm a small grower, I mean, I'm not being regulated and I'm just hearing whatever the small grow shop tells me to put into my cannabis. I mean, there's issues there. It's not a massive grow. So, you know, pesticides might be less, heavy metals. I mean, but I don't have a way to test for that. I mean, do you, what would you prefer Vermont do? Well, I think we'd like to see a little bit more of a commercial structure. Certainly, you know, us in the industry want to see the opportunity for entrepreneurs to come into the state to establish, you know, a retail model there. But you're right, you know, with basically allowing only home grows, you're going to have no testing structure. So no one's going to know the potency of the product they're receiving. No one's going to know what sort of pesticides or herbicides or anything have been used on the plant, if at all. Um, so there's a little bit of a public safety issue there, perhaps. Um, and then we're going to get into, OK, well, if there's not a retail mechanism to purchase this, how are the people going to you know, possess marijuana, right? How are they going to acquire it? Not everybody is going to be growing plants in their house. so. It's going to kind of get back into a, a very strange model where people are going to be gifting cannabis to people and then you're going to be making donations for the gas that they spent coming over or the packaging and handling that they had to you know, undertake to get you the cannabis or you're going to buy a t-shirt for $300 and you're going to get, a, you you know, some, get cannabis. some cannabis. For sure. For so, sure. so it'll be uh, very interesting to see how, how those kind of loopholes and gray areas are exploited. Yeah, it might grow. It, it might be slower in, in Vermont, and, and just a really sort of a hands-off approach. But I think we're all looking at that. Uh, I appreciate your insight in Vermont. Uh, we do need to conclude this episode of Blunt Business. I want to thank you all for joining us on this edition of Blunt Business on Cannabis Radio. You can download episodes of our program by going to cannabisradio.com, bluntbusinessradio.com, or subscribing to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, and now iHeartRadio. We will continue with Jay Kotzer on our YouTube channel, Strainwise Consulting. I want to thank you all for joining us and have an outstanding rest of your week. Okay, George, we good? George, we clear? Yes, we're clear. Good Lord, man. Skype, I didn't want to say nothing, but they're in the recording. I remember the recording came out fine, but Skype itself, the... Gotcha. Hey, George, George, we're still live, buddy, on YouTube. We'll pick it up. Sorry. All right, brother. We'll talk later. <laughs> Thanks, George. Okay, Jay, welcome back. Thanks. Sorry about that. Yeah, I appreciate your patience on that transition. No okay, so New Jersey's newly inaugurated governor, Phil Murphy, wants to expand patient access to medical marijuana. That's right, another Phil. We just talked about Phil Scott, Phil Murphy. <laughs> uh, next, it might We're just be filling our way through this with George. Filling our way through it. I like it. That's good. Good. Next will be Puxitani Phil. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so, so, yes, uh, Phil Murphy. Um, We've been following New Jersey pretty closely. 
Um, you know, he made it a, a campaign pledge that within the first hundred days he was gonna, you know, really address cannabis, uh, adult use, uh, things like that. Um, just recently, he's, he wanted to commission another uh, study to say, hey, let's take a really good look at our medical marijuana program. Under Chris Christie, we, there were a lot of roadblocks. There were a lot of things that were really causing this to, to, you know, to stagnate and to not really uh, attract as many medical patients as, as they think are warranted here. Yeah, and they've done, if you go back to the history of it, two, 2010, like this is the slowest, you know, Governor Christie, like it or not, if he was addressing his, his constituents, his preaching at his base, uh, but man, they have really, th this is the worst example of a slow play that we've seen. Oh, for sure. I mean, the, the patient base is very low. The list of qualifying conditions is very limited. And the, you know, the ability to get a medical card is, is difficult as well. So this is all something that um, Governor Scott's executive order is going to address. And how can we improve this process? How can we expand the list of qualifying conditions? How can we expand the list of products that patients can use? Which, you know, as you know, is a huge boost to the industry if you can expand the product line, right? If you can sell flour, if you can sell um, a number of different products, it, it reaches a greater um, number of patients. Well, and uh, Phil Murphy is, it, what's, what I think is interesting, you tell me if you agree with this, is that he is so focused on revenue. This is the most we've talked about revenue in, in, in light of the new um, tax plan that punishes New Jersey specifically uh, with the salt tax. He's, he's all about, I haven't really heard a governor come out and with, uh, you know, tax revenue first. So there, there's, everything's in line for them to have this. They, they actually absolutely need it. They absolutely do, and I think it's admirable that he's, He's living up to his campaign promises and really addressing this very early on in his in his term. So, and you know what's interesting? I love the fact that New Jersey and New York get to compete, right? And they're competitive states as it is. New York wins pretty much in everything, hands down. But here we have a situation where you see Massachusetts and you see New Jersey now trying to push to get all of those New York consumers to cross the border and buy in New Jersey. Sure, I mean it's and it's causing you know the governor in New York and in other places, Pennsylvania will probably be looking at this as well. Is how can we keep that tax revenue here, and that may mean expanding their medical programs, or it may mean actually transitioning to an adult use market as well. How do you think uh, New Jersey's gonna come into play with this? Do you think they're gonna be a dominant player in the market? Do you think they'll kind of be overshadowed by Massachusetts? What's your view of the program overall? Well, certainly the Garden State is a small state, but its location is, you know, is huge, right? It's all about the location, and I think that it's got enough you know metropolitan areas it's got a huge population base its proximity to new york make it a very very appealing location to start a cannabis business and and gaming historically and marijuana consumption don't necessarily mix we've seen that in nevada where nevada is saying look we don't really want you this got too big for us um, evidently they're competing interests when people get uh, have cannabis in their system. I was gonna say get high, but when they get high, sure. and, I mean it's it's gambling, right? Everything's happening. It's okay. We're all adults here. <laughs> no, when they get high, they probably gamble less, um, or and, they just gamble silly. Well, they gamble silly. <laughs> right? Just, it could be great. It could be. It could be a little maybe. Way. Maybe um, they <laughs> provide more revenue to the, the casinos. I don't know. I've heard some personal stories of you know friends of mine that have you know yeah, a guy you know a guy I know yeah, yeah. visited Las Vegas and. Didn't have the best experience, um, you know, consuming and whoever that guy is. I don't, I don't know who he is, but he's probably in the world of hurt. Probably, you know, he probably is terrible at um, what was the game? I don't know. Okay, <laughs> anyway, yeah. So, uh, but any so along those lines, any um, uh, pushback from the gaming commission in, in in Atlantic City or anything? I haven't heard anything specifically, yeah. but you can expect that. You know, with with Atlantic City struggling financially, yeah. they certainly don't want you know you know, discretionary income being spent on, on other things. You know, they're already competing with, with other entertainment. They're already competing with alcohol and tobacco. You know, this is just going to be one more thing that's going to take consumer dollars away from Atlantic City. Wonderful. So shifting to Colorado, there's a new bill in Colorado that will help track cannabis. Tell us about that. Yeah, so we're in the middle of our legislative session here in Colorado. Um, there's a proposed bill, Senate Bill 29. Uh, it would require all cannabis plants in the state to be marked with a chemical tracking agent. Okay. Think about that for just one second. Yeah. <laughs> the state wants to spray every plant sure. with a chemical agent Should be fine. so that they can track it. And this includes not only marijuana, you know, um, but it includes industrial hemp, hemp products and, you know, marijuana products as well. Um, the chemical agent is not yet 
developed. Right. Um, the Colorado State University in Pueblo has been tasked with developing this agent, and then very similar to what they did with uh, their seed to sale tracking is they would mandate this single product from this single source, and then everyone would be required to use it. Conceptually, I think it's a good idea, not necessarily spraying plants with chemical agents, but sure. the idea of having a better mechanism to track uh, regulated product and to understand what some, when something is falling into the black market. Yeah. Um, but if you think about it, people are already very concerned in the state of Colorado and elsewhere with what is on something that is coming into my body, whether mm -hmm. I'm, you know, whether it's being inhaled, um, whether it's being vaporized, whether it's being consumed through an edible or a topical. Everyone's very concerned with the testing, right? They sure. want to know the potency, they want to know the microbial levels, they want to know that there's no pesticides on these things. And so now we're going to be introducing a new chemical agent which, had, which hasn't been tested and it's going to be consumed by the public. So it's got some issues that probably still need to be worked out, but uh, it's a very interesting bill that's advancing through the legislature. Yeah, when you back through this, you, you know that no marijuana lobbying group came up with this. This seems like somebody who's not in the industry, does isn't aware of how consumers uh, consume, you just talked about that, isn't aware of our history with Michael Blutenau and all the things that we, we've, we've had to get out of our grows, um, and the, the, you know, a lot of the R&D that's happened and the progress in Colorado. This seems like someone from a, from a foreign entity just said, hey, let's try this. Yeah, it would be very interesting to track back and to see where this, you know, the idea for this bill uh, originated and yeah. who's, who's behind that. Uh, it certainly has the support of Governor John Hickenlooper, who we know is not a huge cannabis advocate, right. though he has been, you know, very defensive of, you know, outsiders you know, trying to attack Colorado and its industry. Um, but it is interesting that he's, that he's in support of this bill, um, especially since he signed an executive order basically creating a zero tolerance for any sort of pesticides on cannabis several years ago. This has the feel of like the new Coke, right? When they roll that out, it's a failure. Coca-Cola is big enough to survive it. This doesn't seem like something that will certainly even sell or even other states would entertain. And we, we take pride in Colorado. Things are tested here, perfected here, and other states will duplicate that effort. This seems like it's going to fail. I would hope so. Um, certainly, it's, it's not, the bill is not in its final form. It will go and undergo a series of amendments and go through discussion. Uh, and hopefully, it either dies or it is amended significantly. Okay, so um, and if, you're a, if you're an outdoor grower, Organic. There are a couple of, of, of folks here that are indoor and they're, they're pesticide free. They're phenomenal, but that's not the norm. Uh, there's so many challenges with indoor growing, as you know, uh, but there's some outdoor growers that are 100% organic. Uh, they're green certified. I mean, they're not going to tolerate this at all. Yeah, certainly, because because the organic de designation is is issued by the federal government, they can't claim that they're organic, but they certainly have organic principles involved, and this would be, you know, so far outside of something that they would consider that I would imagine that you'd have huge pushback for uh, from a very big part of the industry, including the the hemp side of things, right? Sure. I mean, this has got to work its way into the water system and be a problem. And if you're if you've got 300 acres in Pueblo and you're outdoor growing and, and your neighbor, you know, this is this is uh, problematic. I, I think it's it's gonna. And as we know, regulatory uh, bodies normally uh, legislate from from a non entrepreneurial standpoint. They're not really pro business. They're just sort of trying to 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 take care of different groups. Um, this could be, we could be dealing with these chemicals for a long time, getting them out of our grow years down the road once we find out this is not necessary. Sure, I mean, and, and you alluded to it earlier, the microbutanol issue is, is something that people here in, in Colorado are still dealing with. Um, you know, it's, it's hangs around for a very, yeah. very long time and it's very difficult to get rid of. Um, the residues of that can hang around for years and can contaminate your product for a very long time without some significant mitigation. So introducing a new product, um, a new chemical to a growing environment, uh, especially one that isn't doing anything for the health of the plant or the, you know, the growth of the plant or the protection of the plant, it's merely for law enforcement purposes, sure. is, is a little troubling. Well, and I'm proud to announce we are the number two most downloaded show on Cannabis Radio now. We have growers listening to us. We're if, number two. It, we, we are. We are. If, if there, I mean, there's Tommy Chong on there, there's Kyle Cushman, there's a lot of big, big heavy hitters big over hitters, there. Uh, there hitters. are no Sean Eubanks. There are not. There are not any gamblers or uh, people that <laughs> mix cannabis and Las Vegas together. I mean, they've got, they're ahead of me in, in, in personal development for sure. 
Um, if anybody's listening, so you've got NCIA who can lobby and help with this. You've got Lead Colorado now funded uh, by some some big guys here. Uh, any way to get involved, uh, public comment or otherwise? How can someone uh, head this off? Well, certainly, as I as I mentioned, it's working its way through the Colorado legislature. So you can certainly reach out to your representatives. Uh, in the Colorado legislature and, and let them know your thoughts about this, let them know what, um, what a blow that it would be to the industry. Um, certainly we're, we're huge advocates for yeah. you know, public you know, protection and for law enforcement and for getting rid of black market product. I think we're all in favor of that. Sure. I think that there's better ways to do that though. Well, and you know, Cora Gardner's a perfect example of that. You know, you follow his history staunchly against marijuana, evolved on that through lobbying efforts or his own education or however he got there. So people can change and I'm sure he's looking at this like that's ridiculous because I've got to assume Corey Gardner with the effort that he makes to go reach out and 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 just he's a staunch advocate, he's got to know enough about the production of cannabis to know this is a horrible idea. You would think so. We haven't yeah. been able to reach Senator Gardner for comment, so... He's listening to the show, though. I'm sure he does. We know he's a fan of the show. I'm sure he does. Uh, so, Senator Gardner, if you're interested, reach out to us by YouTube or otherwise through our uh, website. Reach out to Jay directly, and we're happy to get some feedback on that. Uh, well, Jay, I want to thank you so much for being on the show today. Enlightening, illuminating as, as ever. Uh, such great content. I hope that our listeners on YouTube and on our podcast have enjoyed having you on. Perfect. I love it. High five? All right. High five. <laughs>